Attending the Generative AI conference in San Francisco was like drinking from a fire hose and getting to see some of the brightest minds in artificial intelligence talk about what's currently here as well as what the future of generative AI is. And in this video, I'm gonna run through all of my takeaways from nine different sessions from the conference. They talk primarily about ways that we all can learn and take generative AI into our business, what generative AI is, being able to create content. A lot of you may be familiar with ChatGPT, those types of platforms. And this is really what a lot of the conference was based on is how those tools can be used and how they're going to help make the future of business more automated and how it would affect how we use it. Some notable folks from the conference are Dave Roganmuser, who's the CEO of Jasper AI, Nat Friedman, who was the former CEO of GitHub, Zach King, a filmmaker, content creator. There were some content creators there as well, and a few others from other leading platforms, Dario Amodi from Anthropic, Dean Gomez from Cohere, Kevin Roos, who published this book. We got to hear from him about future-proofing ourselves, as well as Peter Wellender from OpenAI itself to talk a little bit about how that is coming together and just a really good collection of speakers to bring in tons of different information that I feel gave us a glimpse. And also, spoiler alert here, is it also made me realize that even with all of the brightest people in the room, that no one quite knows what's next. So some of the things that I'll share are more so what's happening now but there's no real idea of what's gonna happen after these tools start to get adopted because they've really only been released over the past couple of months. And as any of you know, if you're watching Twitter or any other platform, every week seems to have some other kind of new announcement. So we're all kind of on our heels trying to figure out what's going on. A few of the sessions that I'm going to talk about are we spoke about unlocking creativity, creative workflows, using generative AI. We learned about product releases around products that are helping businesses and creators create more content, create quality content through things like generative AI, Jasper AI, ChatGPT, GPT-3, GPT-4, and so on. We talked about how to future-proof our businesses and learn about ways that AI will help us and in ways from Kevin's talk specifically, how all of that came together two panels about how AI is going to reshape businesses, as well as a panel discussing what an ideal AI tech stack looks like for businesses. Then on the marketing front, learning about how AI is helping with workflows and also isn't getting rid of the traditional marketing model, but instead allowing us to focus on different channels, which I'll share some of my thoughts on that later on in the video. So in the first session, we spent the morning with Zach King, who's a filmmaker and content creator. You may have seen him on some TikTok videos, and he creates really addictive, very viral videos, but does it from the frame of filmmaking. So he went through a live demonstration while we were there of walking through the creative workflow, how he gets his team to brainstorm, and really illustrating that beyond the scenes, behind the scenes of a lot of TikTok videos or a lot of short form videos are actually some ingenuity and a lot of creativity. So some of those videos that you see where people are becoming very famous or getting a lot of views on actually spend quite a bit of time in the workflow. And he talked about the importance of making sure that through any creative process that you go through an extensive brainstorm. And he showed on his slides a outline of hundreds of different sticky notes that they put on the wall for one single video. And then out of that, his team would vote on whatever ideas they think would be the best to test before implementing. So more so having a workflow and how AI helps with this is before they would sit down and be, okay, let's come up with 25 ideas to do X, Y, Z. Well, now you can put into ChatGPT or any kind of other AI generative AI tool and say, give me 25 ideas of what it would be like for a child waking up in the morning to presents on Christmas day. And so boom, it has all these different ideas or whatever it might be. Then you can take that and plot it out, tweak it a little bit and figure it out. So now 
generative AI has the ability to help us with some of these workflow related tasks that don't require the machine to write the whole narrative, but it is helping cut down some time. And you'll see that's a theme through a lot of the talks that we went through. There are tons and tons of different videos that you can see in different pictures. Not only is generative AI creating copy and content, but it's also creating imagery. And right now, still imagery is the most popular form of their seen through Dolly, seen through Midjourney, seen through Lens AI for everybody that's been putting their avatar and having it create new pictures of themselves. So those are where it is now. And the future is that eventually, very soon, the generative AI will be able to create frames and actually create videos of walking through a particular prompt. So you could say a woman standing in the middle of an apple orchard, and then it would show the woman there and maybe some wind blowing through her hair. So now we're at the point where it is still image, still frame. So artists are using this to create depictions of their work. Storyboarding, if you're creating a video, you could actually do a live storyboard where you go through create those generative AI keyframes and then make the story that way to show it visually really for drafting. So the main takeaway I took from this first talk was about how to use generative AI to enhance the creative process and create more of a workflow and also using imagery, using Dolly, using Jasper Art, using any of these tools that are all based on machines creating images from plain text prompts. What's really exciting about this is it's giving the opportunity for a lot of us to be able to explore our creativity and share in a way that we have access to these really powerful tools that are all brand new. We're all learning how to use it, but learning how to use these tools can really help for us to also express ourselves and in an inspirational way, be able to create new kinds of content to try to enhance our workflows and or outside of a work context do something that's a little bit fun and more creative. In one of the Jasper AI keynotes, they talked a lot about what's affecting the world of content and how generative AI is helping to meet demands. And one of those is they mentioned that demand for content and up. And what they mentioned is they said that on digital channels for SEO optimized content is that demands are up and resources are down. Businesses are looking to do more with less. And the Jasper AI team spent some time talking about how they think generative AI is going to help bridge that gap and help to bring in. Now, some of my own thoughts of that are, okay, well, if demands are up and resources are down, does that affect what companies are going to pay for the service? Does it affect what it is there? I have seen a difference in that. I, I don't know. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. There is a increased demand. And we also talked about most of the day is that AI and generative AI is good at getting through the first draft with some of the examples that I've shared. And it also has room to be able to be edited and be still have the human touch. Now, I think in the future, there's going to be a point where the human element will probably not be necessary. But right now, there is not a churn and burn. You put in your input and then it puts out a perfect blog post. It still needs the formatting and everything else done because writing in its own right is formulaic. An outline, the process of writing, any of the greatest writers that I've worked with typically work from either a template or an example, and they go through a process of listing out all of the things that they're going to say in an article, saying it, and then editing it. When you go through the process of working with a generative AI text tool, you're only giving it one prompt and it's having an answer. And I'll re talk about this again in another video. But one of the main points is that the reason why ChatGPT got created out of the GPT-3 model, which ChatGPT is just simply a skin on top of GPT-3. But what GPT-3, what ChatGPT does is it allows you to iterate, which is a much more human process, especially with creativity and content creation. So when you're making a piece of content and then you go back and say, okay, you wrote this, but I'd like to have you emphasize a little bit more on how the mother came home that night in the story. 
And so it will expand on a certain part of it and say, you know, this seems like it's too formal of a tone, want it to be a little more playful or a little more ominous. So then you're able to go through that process of iteration and the conversational AI through ChatGPT is to create more of a sense of going through the process of giving the machine ideas and then having it be honed down. A big reflection point from the Jasper AI team is that two years ago when they started the company, not a lot of people who you would say AI to would take very seriously. And now it seems like every week on Twitter, we're all hearing a new announcement or some new thing that's getting released. So the amount of acceleration is likely to be very blinding. And I would recommend to you personally, whether it's you personally or in business, need to research and understand how to use the tool, because this is my own opinion. Anyone who's not finding ways to use generative AI in their workflow or in their job is simply going to not have an advantage compared to someone who is understanding it, learning how to use it. Now, tools like Jasper AI and others are getting out the middleman where it used to be when I had early beta access to GPT-2 and had used the OpenAI platform for some time. So I started to learn about a little over a year ago, how to learn how to do prompts. And they joked, you used to have to be a GPT-3 or GPT-2 whisperer to figure out how to get it to do anything. So learning how to structure those prompts were really part of learning how to use the tool. Now, these other platforms and AI is going to get integrated in with a lot of things. And I mean, even, you know, Bing now has GPT-3, who knows by the time, or GPT-4 by the time this video is out, who knows, it could already be different. So that going and seeing how platforms are going to integrate it in, you no longer how, need to learn how to use it. But it's sort of like I use this analogy. It's I learn how to ri- how to drive a car with a manual transmission, not required. However, you have a better idea of how the vehicle works, how gears work, etc. So even though you have an automatic, you end up driving that, which I have now, you go through the process of learning or reading music, for example. You start off playing chopsticks on the piano and then you learn how to play Mozart. You don't just start off doing something or if it's on autopilot, you wanna learn how the mechanism works so you can use it more effectively. And I would highly recommend diving in at any capacity you can to try to learn exactly how to do just that. Through Jasper AI tools, is already starting to be able to take live information from Google and feed that into the generative AI model, which means that I could say to the model, could you please write a bio, a speaker bio for Devin Ambron and grab his updated information from his LinkedIn profile and or add a link to his LinkedIn profile into the text. And this is the future of the AI tool and some companies are starting to adopt it. You'll see it a little bit more probably in the coming months. That integration allows to take live information because the model traditionally is only trained up to a certain point. And I believe as of the date of this, GPT-3 is trained in ChatGPT up to January of this year and GPT-3 model until 2021 data. Once it gets access to the live internet, all bets are off, all things are gonna get a little crazy. But now we do have the ability through some tools to be able to integrate that. So if you're looking for very on-time information from Google, you can use tools like Jasper AI to be able to get those insights now because it's going to go out and reach out to the internet and pull that in. That will be integrated in with your command prompts. Integration is another huge piece. Some of these tools are creating Chrome extensions that get in your workflow, show up in Google Docs, combine together with your email to be able to come in and bring text generation and or other types of content like images and things like that. That is also something else to look forward to and tools like Jasper AI are already integrating it in and I think Jasper AI is one of the most competitive in the space. There are a lot of competition and there are, you could of course go to the mothership and go straight to ChatGPT and enter prompts in and get information that way. But using the tool, how useful is it? It's sort of like cameras years ago, I stopped carrying my DSLR camera, my professional camera, because 
the camera that is most useful is the one you'll use. And my camera phone, my iPhone was the one I used all the time. Same thing is going to be for anything generative AI. If you're going to use it and you're interested in it, make sure you're using the one that you have access to and building it straight into your workflow. So that way it shows up, it reminds you to use it and you can get used to incorporating it and allowing it to save you time and also increase output. One of the main issues with generative AI is that it uses what's called large language models, which by definition, the outputs of them are very generic because it's taking from such a large bulk of information. And a lot of questions came up about how is Google going to treat information and content coming out of these models, knowing that they are sometimes going to be repeated content or things that are said over and over again. And that is where I believe the, they do say, Google did say that they don't dislike AI generated content. They just still want to focus on quality. However, there are a couple of things coming out. We didn't talk about it at this conference, but I'm aware of from other research that I'm doing that there are tools that are able to, with some degree of accuracy, be able to tell if there is AI generated content. However, it is going to be very difficult because as you get in and learn to use some of these tools, when you get in and customize it and start to interact with it more, you're actually going to create more natural types of content. So it's really going to be a little bit hard to, to detect, but the natural inclination is let's go write a team. Let's go write a hundred blog posts. We have this tool. The only thing that is difficult, which I'll talk about later is that then the focus on content and even uh, prior marketing person from HubSpot said that they did that at HubSpot and they actually came back and said, what if we generated less content? And it was kind of the new way of them going back and refining old content and was a big part of their SEO strategy at the HubSpot inbound blog writing department. A big feature release of Jasper AI is on brand voice. So normally when you work with one of these models, you have to feed it every little piece of information that ends up in the output. And in the case of this new tool, they're creating more or less a personal library of information that identifies the brand voice. So you'll be able to give it in advance what the company values are, any kind of input, what the customer is. And so these tools are shortcutting. What you would have to do if you were to go to ChatGPT, for example, is you would have to give it everything. You would say, could you write an email newsletter from a startup that helps people learn how to be better with their money, write a post, write something about how Valentine's Day came up and you probably blew your budget, X, Y, Z, and write a post about that, write a newsletter about that, write a this about that. The thing that you wouldn't have to do if you were training the model on your own brand voice is that the release of information would be based off of that brand voice. So defining it up front would allow you, and, and in their example, they use the company that was needing to release 200 assets across all different platforms for a new product release and being able to do that with the brand voice in two weeks because the generative AI was able to go out, create all of that content, and it's based on the brand voice. So it would not need each, you wouldn't have to feed it the information every time and everything would be cohesive. So that is something I think is going to be very powerful for companies as they start to use this at scale, as enterprises start to adopt, adopt the technology, they're going to need a way to make it all uniform. And that's going to be very, very helpful. The next takeaways I have are from Kevin Roos's Future Proofing Your Business Talk. And he's the author of this book, says Future Proof Nine Rules for Humans in the Age of Automation. And he talked about a lot of really great things that I think was probably one of my favorite talks of the day because it gave me a validation on some of the impressions that I have about AI and all the questions that we're all asking ourselves is, is a robot going to take my job? This particular talk, I think, gave me that validation that in the age where everything is getting automated, where humans come in is sort of full cycle, meaning that everything is cyclical. Oh, historically, if you look back into text, really good 
book that just came out, Ray Dalio's The Changing World Order, talks a lot about these cycles, these phases, the falls of empires and so on, and how AI will play into that, I think, is that we'll eventually end up when you are automating everything, what is going to be then valuable are the human elements that are added in. And I have some really good examples that Kevin shared. And I always tell people, how many times do you call your doctor's office and hope that you get a machine? You're delighted when you get a person on the other side of the line. So I think that's going to be things that all of us need to learn with our jobs, with our businesses, to integrate that human element. And I have some ideas that Kevin shared on how to do that. Kevin is a columnist for the New York Times and did a Pew Research survey and 45% of people were equally concerned and excited about what's coming next for AI. And really all of this kind of happened quickly where ChatGPT came out kind of in the middle of the sandwich between Thanksgiving and Christmas and even the VP that came from OpenAI to speak called that out and said, you know, it wasn't really the best time for a launch, but we certainly weren't expecting to have one of the largest user growths in history by releasing it. But it it shows the general sentiment of all of us as we look at it and we think, oh, how is this going to help and or hurt us? And the reach is far. Artists are worried that the apps may be unstable. Mid-journey might destroy income streams for artists. Lawyers were saying that the tool was writing better than their paralegals. And so everybody's thinking that they're potentially out of a job. And he shared a story where a pastor said he had been playing around with generative AI tools and was worried that no one would show up to Bible study because they were just going to put Bible verses into ChatGPT and have them interpreted. So he said, you can already see the headlines about generative AI disrupting God. So We had a laugh about that, and I think the sentiment is that everyone is really just seeing everything that's going on in perspective of themselves, in perspective of work. And I I run a number of businesses, and in marketing specifically, my main business, looking at how it's going to affect marketing, and then on the business consulting side, how does this affect business processes? How is this going to help us become more effective, more efficient, more, more on point with things we're doing, and is a very common sentiment. And AI is not new. 20 years ago, AI was looked at as the thing that was going to come in and change everything. Robots were going to come take jobs, and they did. There were some jobs in the manufacturing space that were taken by robotics and so on. But we always thought that AI historically would come for the blue collar jobs. And now that this tool's coming out, we're actually seeing it. It's actually laser targeted, basically dropping a nuke on white collar jobs and knowledge jobs and the highest paying jobs. It's probably no news to you that ChatGPT has already passed it. I saw the other day it it got a $183,000 programming job with Google. It's passing the MCAT, the medical, medical admissions exam. It's passing the SAT. It's going through and and synthesizing all this knowledge and being able to use language to figure out and answer problems. So these high-tech fields were interesting to see that they're actually becoming disrupted by AI. And we made a joke that coal miners were going to have to get coding jobs. And it used to be the panacea was, okay, let's go in and everybody get a coding job. However, now GitHub has Copilot and Ghostwriter. So there are tools that are also helping coders autocomplete and bring in code and actually generate all of that and debug and work through things. So those types of things are real and they're coming into the space. So the jobs in programming and engineering that we were thought were safe may not be as safe as we originally thought. We were also told that creative jobs were protected and the creative work would be the higher level work that would never get replaced. And that was the exclusive domain of humans. And some things we may not let machines do, but assuming that we're on this journey together and we're learning what is getting used and what's not, we're also going to see that there are Music's being generated, art is being generated, journalism is being generated. And so we thought the ingenuity of creativity was required for those. 
And now we know how that's turned out. These large language models are able to synthesize information, to bring in tonality, to bring in ideas and concepts and even abstractness because it's going through and reading banks of information that we and the developers, I should say the developers of these platforms have decided on this is information that's going to help the model learn and become better at providing good outputs. Kevin talks about the three types of work that he thinks are safe from AI replacement. He calls them surprising, social, and scarce. The three types of areas that he thinks that are not going to get disrupted by AI are surprising, social, and scarce. The first category of surprising work is the work that the AI can't really do well. Normal functions like playing chess, for example. Grandmasters have been superseded by machines years ago for the first time and haven't really turned back. But that's because there's a a repeated set of rules that the machine can learn and slowly improve over time to get better. But without that predictability, a lot of jobs are not like that. And a lot of them are full of surprises, frankly. They're either irregular or chaotic. They may involve the physical world, have things that are moving around, and those jobs are hard to codify. You can't actually get a 10-step manual for how to accomplish a task. If that is the case, then you are able to automate it, but that's only because it is something that's repeatable and it can do. Like, for example, a chef at a busy busy restaurant, you're not going to be able to use an AI model to replace that because it's so chaotic, there's different things going on, and there's a lot of live learning that needs to be done, and the technology just is not there at this point to support that. Where conversely, plumbers or physical work is going to be very needed because that is a, we're, we're going to keep have sewage systems that break down and those things are, are not all created the same. Each house is different, each scenario is different. So there's a lot of new learning to be going on. And these examples are to show you conceptually, you could make some references of your own after hearing that. What is a job? Okay, this one has a repeatable pattern and it's over and over versus another that has different situations for each. So the strategic work of doing that is definitely protected in that case. And in marketing example, the there are parts of it that are automatable. There are parts of it that do need, of course, when you're getting ready to decide and do. And this is what's going to happen potentially is that companies aren't going to need huge teams to do things, but you are going to need people and experts that understand how to break down and look at those different situations and be able to categorize each of the areas in which, you know, you may execute a marketing plan as an example. The next category is social jobs. Those are jobs that AI just won't do. And it won't do that because it fulfills social and emotional needs and it taps into hardwired connection, friendship, and empathy. And it's not about making things, but making people feel things. And they use an example of where a mental health company had used AI to chat with people who needed help. And when they learned that the model had been pre-generated, they immediately had disconnection from it and even a little bit of mistrust. So I think that's telling, at least at this point in time, where if we're creating content or we're creating businesses that are based around AI and how it's going to impact us, that people aren't going to be very happy knowing that there's a machine on the other end writing it. So thinking about that when you do use generative AI to create a merge between reality, or I should say human empathy, and what you're writing. So using it discerningly, using it only in certain contexts, because AI will not replace, at least at this point, any kind of social aspects of how we do our work and how we connect with each other. He gave a really good example of a DVD player versus a porcelain bowl. Our technology has gotten to the point where we can fabricate and create a DVD player for $50. And that, but inside of the DVD player are lasers and motors and silicon chips and connectors and all different kinds of things, anesthetic design externally, software to run it, updates, all, all of this amazing amount of things together. And we're able to put a price tag of $50 to $100 on that, where a porcelain bowl with the technology has been around for thousands of years to create bowls. But this bowl, this handmade porcelain bowl, is still $100. 
So does a thousand year old porcelain bowl also equal the same amount of craftsmanship as the DVD player? But it's actually that the DVD player were able to get in and create this technology at mass scale. So you can kind of see DVD player, porcelain bowl, porcelain bowl still has a high factor of value because it has a human element to it. It's handcrafted, the craftsmanship, I mean, it's been around since the, re the Renaissance. And I think that as DVD players have gone down in price, I mean, when I was little, I remember they used to be a lot more than $100 or $50 even, that the porcelain bowl value is going to go up. So this craftsmanship, this artisanal thing, and Kevin gave an example of his accountant who his whole accounting team were prior stand-up comedians. And the accounting team, the reason he works with them is because they always have, they, you know, when he <laughs> submits his expense reports or is doing reductions or expenses, things like that, he is enjoying the interaction because they're all funny, they're all lighthearted. So those are like elements of things to include. And I loved that example because myself being in improvisational comedy and learning about how like that human element not only helps with customer relations, it also helps with us being able to connect with each other, to bring up the mood, to kind of break the monotony. I think those elements, how we can incorporate art, how we can incorporate comedy into our work, into our business, and that's really going to be the difference between the $50 DVD player and the $100 artisanal bowl. There are also a lot of jobs that are not going to be automated based on the nature of the job. For example, for moral, ethical, or societal reasons, there are just going to be things like a 911 operator, a someone who is operating an air traffic control center, for example. There may be assistant technology to show if there's possible collision courses or issues with timing or schedule or whatever the case might be, but it's not going to completely be replaced by a robot that's just going to automatically make the trajectories and communicate. And it's not because we don't know how to automate those jobs, but collectively we just agree that it's too important to be able to entrust to AI like a 911 operator job. You're going to want to have the human touch and the empathy to understand a situation or a crisis, talking to the person through it, and also figuring out how to problem solve live when someone is in distress. And of course, artists here are at concern. And we talked about how Taylor Swift is not at risk of coming out of falling out of a job. However, the studio musicians who back her may be different. The amount of infrastructure needed to be able to support that empire, that music creation, that travel, that all those things that go into it may not be there. But if as long as you consider what makes your job or business surprising, social and scarce, how do you add in the elements of things that can't be predicted in advance? How do you add in the social element? How do you add in the thing that is the cherry on top, the comedy, if you will? And how do you make it more scarce, the thing that people really want to connect with you on? And some examples of this are companies who are really embracing it and saying, okay, you want to buy a new television? Instead of going into Best Buy, they have a program where a nerd <laughs> comes to your house and sits with you for as long as you need to figure out what exactly it is that you're wanting there. And they're basically turning themselves into technology therapists to figure out in-home tech support and really change the trajectory of Best Buy's model. And those are the types of businesses that are really going to become the future. And I hope that as over time, you know, a lot of us sit in front of computers most of the time. And as a friend of mine says, that you start off your career being a face-to-face -face person. I started doing outside sales out of college. And then I switched to being in front of a computer and that was considered an honor. Then I sort of got chained behind the computer all of these years doing computer work. So I became a screen person where I'm always behind the screen. Started out as a people person, went to a screen person. And then as you accelerate, you become a manager, you own a business, you, you raise up to the top, you become a people person. And I think the, the people people, the ones who are in charge of connecting with others, the social skills and everything that's involved with that are really going to be the things that become valuable in society when everything else is there. We've got the $50 DVD player 
and the $100 porcelain bowl, now we're able to look and see, okay, well, now all we have is ourselves and going in and doing in-home tech support. And so that's going to be a huge advancement in what we evolve into and how we provide value to each other in an empathetic way. In marketing, this is showing up as marketers finding ways to demonstrate whether doing video. I know there's deep fake videos and things like that, so that's also going to be in a threat. But right now, recording your customers a video, recording your prospects a video, getting on phone calls, doing the types of work that we didn't have time to do because we were busy updating CRMs or we were writing marketing emails. Some of these tasks are going to be less laborious and it's going to open us up to having more of a one-on-one -on -one connection and is going to really help us to refocus on that. In another session panel, we talked about how AI is going to reshape business and a lot of really smart people were on the stage, including some of the folks behind the platforms that are doing the generative AI and talking about trends in design, for example, and my marketing company does a lot of design projects and we use tools like Adobe XD, InDesign, Illustrator, Photoshop, as well as Figma. And they did a poll of a lot of the folks in those fields now and What's happening is, is 40% of the user base are not even professional designers, and that's set to even increase. And last week, again, to the point of learning new things on Twitter, which are going to freak us out and make me think we're going to lose our jobs, is that there is now tools that go into platforms like Figma, design tools that you can enter a plain text prompt as to what it is you're looking for, like build me a landing page or build me an iOS home screen or a login screen that has this information or is this color scheme. And boom, it does a little thinking screen and goes in and actually builds that out. So professional designers will have faster prototyping, additional prototyping, and non-professional designers will be able to come up with really quality wireframes to either work with a professional designer on or bring it to flight with a developer that may have some more front end knowledge. So there's a lot of non-professional people that are going to have access to a lot more tools and I think is going to give us all really a very diverse generalist skill set. And if if you're like me, especially early on in business, five years ago when I started, everybody said, you need to niche, you need to get really specific on one area. And what I've learned is that business constantly shifts and changes and there's really quite a lot of things that you have to constantly keep up with and start to work on. And so going through learning that I can't just pick one thing and stick with that forever caused me to be a functional generalist to learn all of these different technologies, all these different ways of helping someone in marketing, helping someone in business and really figuring out how to widen that. And I think not only has it made me more competitive as an individual, but it's also helped me to look at companies now and, and figure out how. Now, I'm not saying to go in and make a company where we'll do anything for you. However, you have to consider that with everybody being able to be a designer, be a writer, be able to create images, be able to automate workflows, to write emails, that what's left. So you got to have to look at the scope of what all the things are and how you'll be able to utilize each to help you be more competitive. There are a lot of technical elements that we talked about. Of course, they got really nerdy about how many billions of data points are in each of these platforms with the language learning models and everything there. So if you have any specific questions about exactly how the models work or how they've kind of worked through, I, I have a lot of insight as to, you know, they were talking about the general ideas what's on premise, what's on device, what processing is happening at your phone, at your computer, at the cloud, in the edge. And there, there is a huge rise in the use of supercomputers to be able to manage the workload and computational ability for these platforms to be able to do. And, and you and I both notice going on any of these platforms, you see there's that dreaded loading screen that's because you've got like half of the world right now or whatever percentage of the world going in and trying to use the tool at the same time. So it's becoming a frustration. They're very aware of it, but there are only so much, there's only so much compute power in the world. And we're currently going to be hitting the top of that. And the hardware curve is keeping up with it. I mean, our phones are able to do more than desktop computers were able to do even 10 years ago. So the fact that our chipsets are updating to the software needs, but there's still a consideration of what's done in the cloud, what's done on device, and that's actually going to affect companies that we invest in. Who do you invest in for 
future, you know, futuristic thinking, like what do we put our money in, our hard-earned money, where do we put it? You know, there's lots of cloud computing that's going to be bigger. There's going to be a lot of any, any silicone or semiconductor companies are going to be massively important for the future because as we take away labor cost, we're going to be putting it into potentially infrastructure cost and maintaining that. So a couple thoughts there, but happy to speak. If you reach out to me directly, I can give you any specific thoughts that I learned there. Some questions did come up about venture capital. There was a few different folks in the room that spoke on behalf of that and where they think money is going with AI. There is a cautionary note to companies that are integrating AI is that it's going to, you know, in the case of investment in general, you may sit, get 20 no's from meetings in order to get your one yes. And it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you have AI at the back of your company, you know, at the end of your URL now, or you have AI incorporated, that venture capital firms or any kind of investment company or individual is going to necessarily think that it's a value. So there's really still a lot of, because it's changing so quickly, I think Silicon Valley, where I'm at now, is really struggling to try to keep up with it. And like I said at the beginning of the, a larger video, that there's still a lot of question mark as to what's exactly going to happen. And first to market is very obvious. I mean, Google Bing and OpenAI are sort of all, I mean, OpenAI is driving all of the, the research. Companies are going to try to create their own models and get ahead of it. But as it all becomes, there's this really funny meme that was like a Scooby-Doo thing. And it had one of the characters lifting up the, you know, he's always chasing after a ghost. And on one side, it had him and it said, what tool are you or what's this new AI app? And then under it, he was lifting the the sheet and it said chat, G, chat GPT on the other end. So my recommendation to app developers, companies, everything else is just consider that very quickly, everybody's going to catch on to the fact that what's driving your application and what's driving the AI is the same platform that every other app has. So how can you add in something that's unique, something that's new, and also think future-proofing that and considering how it could be more social, scarce, and surprising. In the final session of the day, the VP of Marketing with Jasper AI talked about how their tool has helped writers write 15 billion words through the platform in 2022. And that's really big considering that a lot of articles on Wikipedia don't equal more than 4.2 billion. So there's so much content being generated. And besides eco is to think about that we're really on the cusp of creating something great. And as you can imagine, the more volume that something has, including words and text and content, it is going to need to be brought through the lens of quality. And that would be one of my biggest takeaways on the marketing side is that this new influx of content, the ability for all of us to be thought leaders, creators, et cetera, how are we going to use that information to be able to really bring together something that's a lot more curated and more thoughtful? And I've got a couple more thoughts on that in just a moment. And specifically, we called this out, you know, over the years with marketing in general, we are called on to create a lot more content. When social came out, it wasn't just writing blog posts on websites. It was, how are we going to turn this into a video? How are we going to turn this into a short form video? How are we going to post on Twitter? We have to post different on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Snapchat, on TikTok. All of them have a different format, modality, et cetera, that benefit from having very custom tailored approaches to the audience type, the content length, the content delivery method, and so on. So the old school model of ways to use X for Y or five things you didn't know about whatever, and having that very repeatable, very clickbaity title is likely going to be just so oversaturated now where it used to be BuzzFeed was really famous for it. I use that analogy a lot in marketing is that BuzzFeed used to have these articles and listicles and things like that that had just these very viral, very interesting, you know, unexpected, surprising things that you would read through. And that's not really going to be the quality content that we're looking for. And the storytelling approach, the ability to create human emotion and write through. And I've even seen on LinkedIn and other platforms, a lot of this being created. I imagine some of it has to do with generative AI, but friends of mine that had not normally been writers are suddenly writers. So <laughs> they're probably expanding that tool set. Good for them. 
that is something that I think we can all use in business as well to become a little bit more human and not take for granted that just because we can create a blog post on XYZ title that looks like every other one doesn't mean that we should. The AI assisted content strategy has verticals where you have some is spent in drafting and research and composition and editing and distribution. And before a composition used to take up a majority of the time, it took a lot of time to sit down, outline it, write it, and etc. Now we're able to use generative AI in the research process. We're able to use it for composition. And as a result, we're able to ideate, research, compose in a way that allows us more time for editing and distribution, meaning that we're gonna be more thoughtful about how we're editing it, better quality. So my word of caution is that it is going to require still a lot of honing, a lot of adding in, but the time that we're saving on the composition piece, which used to be the most laborious, is now being, we're getting really good solid first, second, third drafts from the generative AI. So utilizing those really solid drafts to bring forth something that we can now focus on bringing in very quality research and distributing it in such a way that is very mindful of the platform and the audience that we're gonna have a lot more custom tailored content if we do not fall victim to the you know, 365 days of content pre-written for you. I mean, they've been selling these templates for years and you literally just put your name or your company in there and replace everything and it generates all the content. Now we're going to need to figure out how do we make this hyper relevant to a specific person? And now that we can talk to, maybe you have three avatars as a company. You could actually write a post or write a piece of content or an email that speaks directly to all three because the composition time is broken down. So hear me through in this quality, 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 especially considering that we're saving time composing the actual pieces themselves. Regarding search, examples that we talked about are what it looks like to search for something with ChatGPT instead of Google, or is to search for something on, on, uh, on Bing and see that when you ask Bing a question, for example, how to tie my shoes, Instead of maybe your company showing up on, on page one or maybe that showing up in search and having a whole list of options, at the very top is a plain text explanation custom tailored to the person searching to answer the question. And prior to AI, Google search engines were used to be the world's ask Jeeves, the world's Google to ask a question. I mean, we made it a verb. Google is a verb because we would go there to have questions answered as well as YouTube. YouTube also, a lot of the traffic on YouTube that comes through is people looking for answers to their questions. When AI creates custom responses, that's going to greatly impact the need or even importance of having any search results. So this is very scary news and I think still uncertain, but the diversification of marketing, if there was any other case but now to say that the uncertainty of search ads, the uncertainty of search of organic is very much going to be in question. And how is all of this redistribution going to be important? And I would encourage you to think about being smarter. We're not trying to make big predictions about how search is going to change, but it is going certain channels, you know, whether it's search, search ads, influencers, referrals, email lists, SMS, every, some are going to be more influential and some are going to be less. And thinking ahead in business, six months, one year, two, three, four years, if you're primarily on an SEO strategy, you have a lot of inbound from that channel, how are you going to protect yourself and also become a little bit future facing on what is going to be the thing that's going to help you stand out? Now, in general, being at the Gen AI conference and getting to connect with really great and smart people, including some of the folks that are behind the technology and to hear in the room the mixture of excitement and a little bit of anxiety around not being able to really keep up with what's going on, I think brought to me inspiration and pause to think about how 
we really can only focus on some certain things and being a little bit future facing, maybe a few months, maybe a year, not getting too wrapped up in the fact that this is like a doomsday call or it's coming for all of our jobs. That kind of thinking isn't very productive. However, I did see that there are some really key strategic plays for companies, not only how to market themselves better, to operate better, to be able to condense down. There is a lot of loss of jobs now and it is a touchy topic. And if you are yourself out of a job or you're yourself having to downscale your team or losing clients, there are tools right now at your disposal to help you either be more effective as a single freelancer or person. And maybe this is the time you've been laid off. Maybe this is the time that it's right for you to start thinking about how you can learn this Swiss army knife of skills that I've been talking about to find a way to market yourself better to the masses and or be valuable to a specific company in such a way that gives you some extra side income or whatever it might be. And then for businesses, seeing how these types of things can help in other ways and the way that I've been using the model actually since the beginning that I started using it was SOP creation, making efficient processes, figuring out how to automate things that we were doing in marketing, be able to pare it down, to be able to communicate better internally, to be able to document, taking video recordings, taking audio recordings, turning those into extensive standard operating procedures, and then going through and using the AI to do a lot of the structural work that you know you could take an outline or say, hey, I've got this idea to do X, Y, Z. Then the AI takes that and turns it into a fully fleshed out thing isn't just exclusive to writing an email or a social post. Think about how that AI technology can help you write tasks and descriptions in platforms like Asana or Monday.com or ClickUp and how you function in your business or your job or your role, technical writing. There's lots of other areas that this can help. So doing the best to stay ahead of the curve. And please, please, please do not put your head in the sand with this one. I am definitely not a doomsday person or someone who thinks that everything's going to be radical, but this is absolutely going to be something that is going to change all of our lives. And being here in San Francisco, spending time with the OpenAI team, with Jasper AI, with Cohere, and a couple of other platforms that are also creating their own language learning models, there's change in the horizon. If you've got any questions or want thoughts on strategy or what other things could be applied, just comment, reach out to me. I'm happy to provide any insight. I will ask that you watch the whole video before, so that way you get my general ideas and takeaways. And anything really beyond this is just speculation because everything is changing week by week. Thanks for listening. And I encourage you to get on ChatGPT, get on some generative AI tool and start giving it a go.